WCLN 1170 Radio and Cable Channel 16 are pleased to present We Should Know, hosted by J.W. Simmons, an upbeat, informative look at people, places, and issues facing our community. This education-based analysis of issues will remain positive and informative as we consider closely what we should know. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We should know it's on there. We're coming to you from Star Communications, Channel 16, WCLN Radio. There's a summation in the Samson Weekly newspaper every Tuesday at 2.30. Appreciate very much the comments that you send us at we should know edu at gmail.com. We should know edu at gmail.com. Today's conversation is about local governments, particularly local governments and staffing throughout North Carolina in the rural part of the state. There's a new program out called Lead for North Carolina. And it starts here. It's being housed by the UNC School of Government um, there in Chapel Hill. We have got two folks with us today. Tom Hart's well known, city manager, city of Clinton. Been here long enough now that you're just a Tom name around here. And uh, Tom, we appreciate you being here today. And also Sylviana Holmes, who's a graduate of East Carolina University and uh, graduated in communications and leadership in your, your major areas. Uh, Silviana, you're part of the program we're going to be talking about today. To start the program, I want to start with a uh, big shout out to City Manager Tom Hart and the City of Clinton for allowing this program to be housed right here in, uh, should I say, walking distance of your office, Tom? That yes, was, it, was a, it was a short, short, it, <laughs> short jaunt down the hallway. Yeah, and, and we, we're kind of like that, that, uh, those folks that show up and won't never leave. We've been here for a while, so they, they've been good enough to yeah, allow us to come back. Uh, Silviana didn't do this now for about a year as a result of some flooding at Star Communications. So again, we uh, publicly thank you and the city of Clinton for that, Tom. Uh, let's start uh, to talk a bit about this program. and that This is a national program. Uh, that's dealing with what appears to be statistically a shortage in leadership positions, Tom, in uh, local governments, particularly local governments in rural areas. And the mission statements, one of the key parts here in this mission statement in North Carolina says most promising recent graduates in two-year local government fellowships and their hometowns and areas struggling to attract talent. By struggling to attract talent, that is to attract people that are interested in jobs in local government that have the qualifications and skills. How big a deal is this? Uh, it's a very big deal, uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be covering it rather extensively, but uh, there are a great deal of government. The government workforce in general is a little bit older than the, the population at large or the workforce at large. Uh, so there are a lot of government employees who are eligible to retire. And I think we sort of conjure up these images of this sort of retired in place, sort of entrenched bureaucrat, like, oh, good, it might be good to lose those people, but mm -hmm. um, it's just not the case at all. Um, there's a great deal of institutional knowledge that walks out the door every day um, from a lot of our, our government employers. Uh, Silviana, you, you're kind of part of this because you were part of this program. You graduated from East Carolina. Uh, you're now kind of working uh, with Tom here looking at what's going on. You, you had a, a mindset uh, that you might want to get involved in local government leadership. Tell us, tell us a little bit about you and how that kind of permeated and how this program works and networks well with what you want to accomplish. Um, it definitely started with service. Um, when I first got to East Carolina, that was how I met most of my friends and I learned about a, a different program very similar called Citizen U and that's when I learned about what local government was because I had no idea what local government even was until about my senior year. Um, and so through learning about that and citizen engagement and how to make communities better um, is what really intrigued me about it because growing up in Beulahville, a rural North Carolina um, town, most people think they have this idea that you have to get out of rural communities in order to be successful. And it just kind of made me think, like, why does it have to be that way? Um, and so I really wanted to be able to come back home and do something within the community that could help me, you know, pay bills, but also, like, fulfill something that was fulfilling um, and knowing that I was serving my community. And so this was, like, spot on with what I wanted to do. And aside from that, I also think it's a great idea for other young people to get involved in their local governments um, just to learn how things work. Because I've been here for about two months, but I've learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. 
It's, it's kind of like when you get boots on the ground, it might be a little bit different than it was in the classroom. Yes, a lot <clears throat> different. So, Tom, how does this paradigm, and, and I think uh, Silviana nailed it when she said that typically we've kind of encouraged people, you know, look at big cities, go to Atlanta, go to Philadelphia, go to some of these places. If you really want to make it, you got to get, get out of this, quote, corn row or this tobacco row or whatever it may be. Has, are we changing the paradigm here to say there's something of substance still in rural areas that you can find that, that not only satisfies your job skills, but also that kind of burning feeling for the word whatever success is for you? Well, there's certainly opportunities everywhere, urban communities, rural communities. Uh, my career path took me to Dobson, North Carolina, Boiling Springs, North Carolina, and then to Clinton, North Carolina. So I have really, uh, other than internship experience, I have really yet to work in one of the, the, the major metropolitan areas. And I've found uh, my career to be very uh, rewarding. And, and I think by most metrics, people would say it's been successful so far. Um, so I have certainly not uh, I have not found any uh, lack of opportunity in rural areas. Uh, I think that really in a lot of industries what you're starting to see is, is there's probably some technology element that's starting to sort of blur that line between what's rural and what's, what's urban. Um, there's certainly, just by virtue of density, there's certain amenities and things like that that, that, that urban areas are going to have that rural areas aren't, but I think rural areas are becoming increasingly connected. Sylvia, so coming from a rural area, uh, the, the Tom's words uh, probably are magnified for you because you just mentioned that you wanted to kind of stay and serve in that area, and that word has been used now about four or five times in our conversation here as we get into it. What does that service uh, thing mean? That it, when you look at service from your perspective in this kind of challenge that you want to get into, how do you balance that with income and the social need? that you need as a person. Uh, at some point in time, it's, it's got to balance for you because obviously you're a person that wants to serve people, but at the same time, you don't necessarily want to live in the back of a truck either. No, <laughs> um, I think service for me is doing everything that I can to bridge the gap between um, need and resources. And there are a lot of people like myself who have been fortunate enough to leave and be able to come back. Not everyone has the opportunity. And so um, the people in the mission statement, it talks about most recent, most promising mm -hmm. graduates. Mm -hmm. um, so people like myself who have had the opportunity to leave and come back, it, it's going to take us coming together um, and spreading the mission statement throughout the community because um, not one, it's, it doesn't take just one person. And so doing everything that we can and putting our resources together to make sure that other people have the same access and the same opportunities that we had, even if they choose not to take it, just um, making sure that they still have the opportunity if they want to. Tom, this program, when you look at it from the position you're in as a city manager, um, does it give you opportunity to look at, at multiple graduates that may have some impact or you are you assigned people that uh, are willing to come to Clinton and kind of work through and see how things go uh, what what's the ultimate goal uh, I suppose I would describe the selection process or the assignment process as being sort of a hybrid of the things that you've described um, Clinton is this is the first year of the program in North Carolina mm -hmm. um, so I believe there are 16 fellows yes. throughout the state uh, and they basically went around and ident they were looking for communities that had certain things. Uh, I think they gave some preference to communities that had been Im impacted by disaster. Mm -hmm. um, I think they were looking for communities. The way they explained it to me on the phone was they were looking for a community that had someone there that could mentor the person. And I told them I wasn't sure who they were talking about, but we could probably find somebody that could that could take Sylviana under their wing. And Just actually, so happened his name was Tom. So. Well, I, I didn't really see it that way, but I was flattered that they did. Yeah. Um, so they were looking for a few things in the community, and then, of course, they had these students. And uh, in our case, actually, they sort of, because they want to put the students close to where they're from, they sort of already had this match in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, we were given the final say. But after after looking at uh, Sylviana's resume and, and speaking with her on the phone, um, it seemed like it was going to be a good fit. It's kind of a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sylviana, if, when when you look at it from where you are and you think about the program, where you're at now, and and I suspect you've been here a few days anyway. What has kind of intrigued you, or what have you seen here in the city of Clinton? that causes you to reaffirm the fact that you want to be somewhere involved in leadership in, in uh, local government, or maybe has caused you to rethink it altogether? 
Um, I definitely think working with the city manager has um, reinforced my desire to be want to be a leader in local government. Um, I grew up not too far from here, but I thought I knew Clinton still. But when I got here, I realized there was so much about Clinton that I didn't know. And so um, in helping with like community events in like the downtown area, meeting people from the community, local business owners, I realized um, that it's more so about the community aspect for me. And so being able to build those connections um, really reinforced like my reasoning for wanting to be here. Tom, you know, sometimes it's, uh, I in talking with you off camera and on camera and talking to other city managers and county managers, th there's a sense of expectation maybe the general population has. Then there's an, a realistic expectation that only people know this in leadership positions that may or may not happen. One of those could be broadband. We could say mm -hmm. everybody's going to have broadband in six months. Uh, I think we could all probably also say ain't going to happen. Um, <clears throat> How much does that play into this program and trying to get folks to understand where they are and the benefits and also kind of the realistic part of it? you got about 30 seconds to hit that. If we need to come back to it, we can because we're going to take a break. Go ahead. Well, there certainly is a lot of daylight between expectations and what's probably realistic. I, I sort of take to say, you know, we, we live in the, the, the era of two-day shipping, mm -hmm. and sometimes it is hard for government um, to keep up with that. Government structures aren't necessarily made to move quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, what you're talking about is, is, is a lot of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there is definitely a gap between those two things, and, and we're always trying to educate and help people understand the processes. We're going, we're going to take a break. Um, Silviana, uh, Tom's been on a number of times. This is the way we kind of roll here. So when we take a break, we're going to come back. I want to pick up on that expectation piece and maybe get your input as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. We're talking with Tom Hart, city manager of the city of Clinton. We're talking with Silviana Holmes, who is a fellow here working with a new program called um, uh, Our Mission here in North Carolina to get new leadership into local governments and rural areas. We're back. Experiencing slow internet? If you have a fast internet package, the problem is most likely your wireless router. With more devices using Wi-Fi, your wireless router may not be able to deliver the speed and coverage you need. We now have the leading solution to enhance your internet experience. Using small devices in a mesh network, these Wi-Fi appliances cover just about any size home so that all your devices can operate to their fullest potential. Whole home Wi-Fi from Star Communications. Get the most out of your internet connection. Welcome back. Thanks for being with us today. We should know on the air each and every week for the past nine plus years at 2.30 on Tuesdays coming to you from Star Communications Channel 16, WCLN Radio, 2.30 every Tuesday. Tune in, also uploaded to YouTube. You can pick that up as well. We're talking today about a program called Lead for North Carolina. It's being housed at UNC School of Government. It is a national program. Uh, there's 16 fellows, I think, in the state now. Uh, Sylviana Holmes is one of those, graduate of uh, East Carolina University. Uh, thank you for being with us, and Tom Hart, who is the city manager here in the city of Clinton. Let's pick up from our first segment. I want to kind of follow up on that expectation piece. Uh, oftentimes when we look at that, we tend to think, well, I can expect more if I go to a larger city. But the crunch is on whether it's a large city or a small city. What we're really talking about with this program is increasing the talent pool. Is, is that kind of a reasonable way to put that, Tom, particularly for you to have people to come in that you can rely on that when you say, look, I want you to take care of whatever it may be, whether it's a sewer problem or whatever it may be, that you've got people that you know can handle that and understand that. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not putting that in a negative way. I'm just saying you almost have to have that, do you not? Yes, I rely on a great number of, of people with technical expertise that goes far, far beyond mine. Um, I say I don't manage the city, I manage the people who manage the city, and I, I do think that that's, that's highly accurate. Um, I, I rely on a great deal of, of, of different people to have um, specialized expertise, because I don't really have specialized mm -hmm. expertise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Silviana, as, as we look at this program, uh, hopefully there's people out there that maybe hadn't heard about this. Uh, that maybe they want to kind of look at this as a possibility for them. How, how did you get engaged with it? What is uh, the process you went through to become 
uh, a fellow with this program, a, a kind of a leadership fellow with this program? Yeah, so um, this is actually the first year that they're doing it, so I'm a part of the pilot cohort. I just happened to be sitting in the library one day and email came across my inbox about Lead for North Carolina. No one had heard about it. I had no idea what it was, but I did some research on their mission and their vision, and I decided to apply for it. It was a pretty lengthy application process. Um, there was about three rounds of interviews. Um, we were able to meet people from the School of Government, and um, then we interviewed with different cities. And so um, it was a very, like, couldn't relationship building process though like even some of the people who weren't able to be a part of this cohort like we're still able to keep in contact with them um so it's very community based and um anyone who's interested in it i would say like it's it's definitely been rewarding for me aside from being able to serve in the city like still having the cohort as support and the school of government as support as well so when you, if somebody is interested and they're listening out there today, they could actually just Google Lead for Government NC and probably pull up that website or something? Yeah, so um, we're actually in the application season right now. Yeah. So they could do um, Lead for America. The Lead for North Carolina application process will start up in about January. Mm -hmm. But they can go ahead and apply with Lead for America. And then if they're interested in North Carolina specifically, um, they'll be contacted about that in around January. So the beauty of, of, of this <clears throat> is that if they're really interested and they you know, maybe want to expand their possibilities if they go to Lead for America it may be in some other state there's somebody that's needed yeah. because we, we have these areas throughout the country. Yeah so um, we just launched Lead for Minnesota with the national organization too and Lead for America has about 50 to 60 fellows nationwide um, so it's definitely growing which is it's been incredible to watch because last year this time it was just an idea. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been incredible to watch them grow and also be a part of the growing process. Has this been a huge financial benefit for you? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you, so at some point in time, it comes down to the numbers, you know. So I got to um, ask that question because people are looking at this. Is there, do you need to start looking at it in your junior year or senior year in, in college? Or I'd say senior year. Um, I would also put don't get into it just for the finances because it is a service-based fellowship. Absolutely. Um, so there are going to be some hours that are not paid, um, but it's been rewarding nonetheless. Okay. Tommy, you think this is something, when I look at the last part of this mission statement, it talks about together we can strengthen our public institutions, transform our local communities, and cultivate the next generation of public service leaders. That's a pretty profound statement. I mean, it just, I know it's the first year here, but that's kind of dynamic when I look at a mission statement. I think, really? You're going to do that? <laughs> but that's, these words really mean something. Yeah, we talked about that that retirement cliff, and that's something that has been a, a pervasive theme throughout mm -hmm. my career. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I was probably recruited into this about ten years ago under some sort of similar, you know, mm -hmm. older people in the profession realizing that you need younger people in the profession. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people sort of hypothesize that younger people are not wanting to get into government, and it's almost made as though maybe they're selfish or maybe they have different work-life balance mm -hmm. expectations. Mm -hmm. and, and I think maybe there is some work-life balance. I mean, the, uh, the city manager job does not necessarily always lend itself yeah. to uh, yeah. a fantastic work-life balance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I really think that that sort of, sort of misses the point. I think that young people are uh, today are just as much dedicated to service and making impact in their community. Um, they're just as in touch with maybe your generation might have been thinking of, you know, Kennedy asking, uh, you know, don't ask what your country can do Absolutely. for you, but what you can do for your country. Absolutely. So I think that that vein is still very much there, but I think what you're actually seeing is that increasingly younger people don't see government as the vehicle by which to have that impact that they want to have. Uh, in fact, there's some numbers that, uh, that I was looking at before we got here that talked about, uh, you know, not only is application into uh, graduate programs that are that are government administration related those numbers are down so there's not as many students going into those programs mm -hmm. but even once we get students into programs like a master of public administration degree uh, program even once we get them in there increasingly the graduates are not going to work in government uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, the master's programs in North Carolina were reporting that 60 to 70 percent of their students were actually going into local government when they graduated, and now that number's down closer to 40 percent, um, and it may even be lower than that because I'm, I'm working off of a somewhat dated number. Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you that my experience going through school was there were 
I went to Appalachian State University, which has a master's of public administration program that really prides itself on on making town and city managers. Uh, and even that program, there was really a handful of us in it that thought we were going to go and be city managers. A lot of people uh, were going and working in the nonprofit space. Now, uh, more power to them. That's a fantastic route as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but we really need to change this dynamic and make people understand that there's still a great deal of impact that can be done working in local, local government. That, that, those words that Tom just imparted, how does that follow with you when you when you listen to that there's there's all these kinds of things going on and let's think now and, and Tom just mentioned he's been in for about 10 years 10 years from now uh, Silviano where, where do you see yourself have you been able to acquire enough information thus far to give you some kind of inkling of light as to where you want to apply your service desire to to work with local government is there a particular because we're not talking just city manager positions or those kinds of things. There's multiple layers, as Tom just pointed out. Um, yeah, I, he has done a great job of allowing me to be immersed into the different aspects of local government. So I've been able to pretty much spend a day with all of the department heads, you know, public works, fire, police, um, all of those different departments. And so, like, it took me about I'd say three to four weeks to come to the conclusion that this is what I want to do. And now being two months in, I would say that I would go as far to say this is where I want to be, um, falling in love with the community. And then hearing that it, it makes me feel better because when I was still in school, I thought that I had to go into nonprofit in order to serve. Um, but now I'm realizing that I can do that here as well. So it's rewarding and also encouraging to hear that. And yeah, I'm excited. Tom, do you think people really get the word service when they think about government work? Oftentimes you hear folks say, well, you know, I'm going to apply for a job with the city or the county or the state. But all of it, if it's government related, is public service in the dynamic of it. It, it, do they get that going in? Is there some way? I mean, everybody hasn't been through the education Silviana's been through, so they, they may be applying and come in, well, I, I was just looking me a good job. But they're really saying, I'm willing to go beyond that. And the reason I thought about that question is because you mentioned the Hurricane piece. Uh, the, the cities and counties and towns in the eastern part of the state have been hammered mm -hmm. for the past few years. And I know workers have worked multiple hours of overtime. Uh, and to your point, Silviana, uh, some of them get paid, some of them don't, but we're talking 24 hours a day sometimes. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, goodbye. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's service through and through. Um, and I, I like to think that we in the city of Clinton run a very, very service oriented uh, organization. I think I would hope that Sylvia would, yeah. would be able to get her word on that shortly. Um, <laughs> and, and that's a that's a top down thing. Uh, it starts with the elected officials having that attitude and instilling that attitude and giving it to me as a policy directive. And then it basically flows down from there. Um, but I mean, everybody, no matter what job they do, um, the guys that mow the grass, it's, it's, it's public service. Um, the guys that come and, and, and get the, tr the, the tree limbs out of the yards, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's public service. So we've got a lot, uh, a lot to offer here in the city besides just some of the, the sort of, I, I call them the kids books, local government mm -hmm. jobs, you know, the firefighter, the police officer, the I want to be book type of jobs. Um, when people like Silviana or some of the youth groups come and tour, I think one of the things that surprises them is how many different varieties of jobs that we have. The, the city of Clinton employs people that come to work in a lab with the white coat on every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think a lot of people don't realize the sheer variety uh, of jobs that you can have that still have this, this thread of public service running through them. I, th I think the other thing, Silviana, when we come back, I want to, uh, we'll take another break, but when we come back, I want to talk about that bit, is, is the diversity that's involved in local governments and these niches and job functions, and it is broad range. So uh, for somebody like you or folks that want to get in this program, they're not isolating themselves to just two or three positions. There's multiple positions that exist. So we're going to take a break, and we'll be back in a moment and talk about a lot of those issues. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us. We'll be back in a moment. Call a friend or somebody that may be interested in this, and uh, we'll be back and uh, have some more information on this program that might impact your life.
You come out to replace a bad sensor and that has a five year commitment to my contract and you don't tell me, here's your sign. Switch to the sign that's keeping home secure and customers happy all over the area. Security from Star Communications. We pride ourselves on fair pricing and quick, friendly service every time. Somebody try to break into this place? Security from Star Communications. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, we should know on there talking about a program lead for North Carolina. It's a national base program, the Institute of Government at Chapel Hill is housing the program here, kind of the first year in. We're talking with Sylviana Holmes, who is a graduate of East Carolina, who is involved with this program, got involved because she filled out an application. And guess what? She got selected from over in uh, Duplin County. And uh, Tom, uh, Tom Hart, everybody knows that name because if you have a problem in the city of Clinton, you're somewhere at the top of the list on that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, you know, I want to kind of talk about uh, a few things that, that were pointed out in the in the information here that need for graduates and it's said the most important factors in people choosing jobs out of college and they list five of those one of them is meaningful work number two was surrounded by and engaged peers skill training and mentorship opportunities for advancement and financial compensation i was interested when i looked at that to find that financial compensation was number five you know for, for a lot of people say well i want a job that pays good money but that's really not it is it Silviana? um no that wasn't the case for me at all and i i think it was because i knew that if i needed to i could come back home and you know, work and save up until I was able to be able to afford some of the things that I wanted. But um, pretty much, like I said, the top of the list was meaningful work to me. It didn't matter if I made you know the most money I've ever made in my life if I hate my job. So um, being able to say that I absolutely love my job, even on days when I have no idea what I'm doing, um, but being able to learn and just um, learn and grow while at work and if it feels like I'm getting a second education for free almost or mm -hmm. getting paid to get a second education so um, that's been very meaningful for me and I wouldn't trade it for anything. With this mentorship thing that you're involved with how long does that last is that months or a year or I mean working with Tom and looking at different departments and evaluating what's going on. How long does that last? Um, so the fellowship itself is a two-year fellowship, but um, I have no doubt in my mind that these connections that I'm making now will last beyond that, maybe even a lifetime. Um, and I've been able to connect with other department heads. Like I get to sit in on the department head meetings, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to have those connections as well outside of just the mentorship, knowing that I can go to whoever for whatever, that's been um, very helpful. So. Yeah, I'm hoping that it lasts longer yeah. than two years. Tommy, it seems to me that to be able to have this kind of talent uh, available, I mean, th th it would kind of be a no-brainer. You know, if, <clears throat> I, if I were in your position, I think I would be looking and going, hey, can I get uh, some more people? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a savings to the city. I mean, It is a savings to the city. Um, basically, I learned about this because when they were trying to recruit people into it, they went to the city manager's annual meeting in Winston-Salem mm -hmm. that happens every year. Uh, uh, late January, early February. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I actually did not go to that session, uh, but a good good friend and uh, colleague of mine almost literally came running down the hall waving the pamphlet around yeah. at me and was like, you have got to check this thing out. And I actually don't think they got into the program. Mm -hmm. So, right. but he was like, he said, you can get a, you can basically get a college educate a, you can get a college graduate yeah. you know performing it at the level that you would expect them to be able to perform at uh, for a fraction of the cost because there's a lot of there we do pay a little bit of money to the school of government to mm -hmm. administer the program um, but there's charitable grants basically that, that take care of the salary so um, we basically have a a full-time salaried employee with a with a college degree that's able to uh, help us run with a lot of projects do a lot of things that I don't have time to do and uh, it, it's been fantastic. She's been able to implement, uh, she's taken a lot of things down off of my whiteboard of, of to-do lists, to-do projects. Yeah. I mean, I could just, I'm just sitting here thinking just research and analysis alone would be a gold mine. If, if it were me, I'd be, the, yeah. yeah, take care of this, give us, tell me what the number says so I know which way to go. Is this something that maybe a lot of the folks out there that are in county and city governments, is it just for municipalities and local towns or is it also for counties and county government? 
I believe county governments yeah. are definitely eligible. There are some county governments in the program, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's expanded to nonprofits that may be doing quasi-governmental functions. Mm -hmm. I believe it is just units of government at this point. Well, Silviana, two years. Um, you've been here how long now? Uh, since August 1st. So uh, give yourself another year and a half or so. You certainly would know not only what area, uh, and if again, if you're here two years, um, I don't see you going anywhere for some reason. <laughs> Do you get that feeling already? I mean, yeah, like I absolutely would love to live in Clinton. Like yeah. I, I commute right now, but mm -hmm. like just the square fair that we had this yeah. past Saturday, just like meeting everyone and seeing how much fun it is Some wonderful people to be here. in Clinton. Yes, I, it's a no-brainer. Absolutely. I want to touch on this a bit, and you alluded to it a while ago, Tom. Uh, the reality of our state, 70 percent of the country's non-metro counties have seen a decline in population since 2010. Uh, and, and these numbers are a little bit interesting in that the median age of residents in Tier 1 counties, you can talk about what a Tier 1 county is, um, median age of Mecklenburg and Wake is 35. <clears throat> you, you see the, the change in the demographics, 50% average labor participation rate for Tier 1 counties and states over, uh, overall rate is 61%. These numbers causes you to step back and think a little bit, doesn't it? They absolutely do, and probably the, the most shocking one on that page is that half of the growth in our state in the last exactly. 10 years has been in Mecklenburg and Wake County, Exactly. Um, which I grew up in one of those counties. But, uh, but yeah, there, there, there's a great deal of inequity um, in, in terms of those numbers, um, in terms of their implications for workforce development, mm -hmm. and that's probably the big one, is it is hard for rural areas to, it, it's, not that, it's not that people are smarter in Wake or Mecklenburg, it's just that there's a critical mass of people. There's just a critical mass of workers with skill sets available, and it's harder to it's harder to to attract them here because there's just not as many people. The idea of 70% of local government leaders uh, in North Carolina are eligible for retirement. Um, obviously, that doesn't in include you at the moment, but when you look down the road 10 or 15 years, uh, that window also may be including you. So when I think about it right now, though. Silviana, that's got to be huge for you as you think about looking at the numbers. North Carolina, 70 percent local government leaders are uh, becoming available for retirement. Does that say to you, whoa, I might be in demand here somewhere? <laughs> yeah, it definitely does. And the fact that there's only 16 fellows in North Carolina right now. So if we were to have someone retire within the next two years, um, there's a possibility that there may not be anyone to replace them and then that increases the workload for other people within the local government. So it, it gives me hope that there is going to be more opportunity for people who are in my cohort but also the people that are going to come after us um, to have some job security. But it's also like they're going to they're gonna need people in these local governments potentially before we finish our fellowship. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a bittersweet statistic, but hopefully um, with programs like this, um, that statistic will decrease significantly within the next five to 10 years. Tom, I know you're always a, a future thinker. You're always thinking down the road. What does that say to you about retention and keeping people once you get them? If you have the opportunity to have folks come in and, and working for you, um, how important is it to be able not only to retain those folks, uh, but given the statistics, that's one of the problems is, is not just hiring, but keeping them on the job and making sure they understand what that job is and making sure that they have some sense of appreciation. And back to the financial piece, you've also got to have a certain baseline of financial. Right. Uh, but is that a big issue? I mean, just keeping people working and making sure they stay with you? Yeah, it certainly can be, and and I would first start by say, by reassuring Silviana that the uh, the the retirement crisis and the need for young people to get in this line of work will very much so still be here when you when yeah. you're done with this program, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. it will very much so probably still be here if you pursued a master's degree. So That's four right. or five years, it's 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 definitely still mm -hmm. going to be here. Um, you know, to, we've known for quite some time. To your to your question, JW, we've we've known for a long time, and employers and human resources professionals have been able to tell you for decades, it's a lot easier to hold on to your existing employee than it is to bring on a new person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so yeah, retention can be an issue for us. Um, retention of, of 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 younger people can be an issue for us. Um, so I would just 
echo what you're saying, that it, that it's, it is occasionally hard to retain people. Um, I think one of the keys to doing that is, is attaching them to the things that we were talking about earlier, attaching them to the purpose of work, mm -hmm. um, to, the, to the public service angle, and, and being the best workplace that you can be. And one, one of the things I, th I think a lot of these studies have pointed out is this whole aspect of folks that are in these uh, disaster prone areas, and Clinton would be one of those. It's, it's hard also to, to maintain normal kinds of operations. So some of the things you may have learned in the classroom may be just out the window, especially if ever the lights is out and buildings are blown down. You know, it doesn't work. The formula just don't work. So how does that fit into this whole conversation? I mean, you've been here when some of these things happen. We've been fortunate, mm -hmm. but we've also experienced a taste of it. Yeah, it seems like we're going to be on the every year or the every two year plan it at does. this point. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it, we're still cleaning up paper. There's a lot of individuals that, of course, are still working through um, getting benefits related to Matthew. Um, the city is almost done uh, working through some of its paperwork uh, related to Florence. Uh, Dorian was luckily a, a sort of a glancing blow. Uh, so we, we were pretty fortunate there, but uh, Sylviana is probably a sort of a poster child for being thrown into that because mm -hmm. I think she'd been here for maybe a month mm -hmm. uh, when we had to start having our meetings where we were, you know, kind of getting into the, into the back room and looking at the, the hurricane coming in on the monitor and stuff. And I, I think she was probably a little bit disappointed that I told her I had to send her home. I, I couldn't really, I said, you can't, I'm sorry. I can't bring you down into the bunker. I don't think, yeah, yeah. I don't think the school of government would forgive me if something happened to you. So, yeah, exactly. you know, you know, head, head home. Uh, but, but I think she certainly has gotten to see what you're, what you're talking about, which is that sort of interruption of normalcy. Um, and people do expect us to kind of snap right back to it. You know, the storm comes through, and to your point, people have worked long, hard 24-hour days, and, and, and then it's Monday, and it's time to pick up the garbage because it's Monday's route. The, the <laughs> dynamic and what change is redefines itself, mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of, as, as Tom just said, I think one of those things, it seems like we're on the plan of every other year we're going to get hit with something, and I just hope it doesn't move to every year. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with Tom Hart, City Manager of uh, City of Clinton here in Sylviana Homes, who is on a very special program called Lead for North Carolina. She's been with us now for a few months. Hopefully she'll be here for a few years. We'll be back in a moment. Stay tuned. To get the most out of your electronic devices, you need a strong internet connection and a protected home Wi-Fi network. You need high-speed internet from Star. Star has the fastest, most affordable high-speed internet service available for all your devices. We have no long-term contracts or high-pressure sales. Our service speaks for itself, and switching is hassle-free. We take care of everything with free installation from a local company high-speed internet from star internet at the speed of life ladies and gentlemen welcome back we're coming up on our last segment here on we should know today uh, again we look forward to seeing you each and every tuesday and we always want to welcome you back and ask for your input and continue to input you can email us at we should know edu at gmail Dot com. We should know edu at gmail.com. We're talking with Tom Hart, city manager, city of Clinton here in Sylviana Holmes, uh, who is a recent graduate of uh, VCU. That's over in Greenville, North Carolina, in communications and leadership. Been working here now on a special program called Lead for North Carolina, which is part of a national program. And uh, you're one of 16 folks now that's kind of working through a fellowship thing. And uh, you've been kind of assigned here in the city of Clinton. This program is designed with kind of uh, the, the model is kind of what they call a solution-based model. Theory of change, creating solutions for local folks here, but it, it talks about recruiting dynamic and diverse leaders across the state. I, I want to start with you on that point. Um, what's your definition of a dynamic and diverse leader? Oh, um. <laughs> <laughs> didn't see that one coming. I did didn't. <laughs> but um, I would say that a, dyna a dynamic and diverse leader is someone who has had different experiences, um, someone who is very relationship oriented, um, people person, some would say, um, and just someone who has an open mind. I think that can be somewhat hard to find um, these days. So. I, I would say those three things as far as like dynamic and diverse leader, someone who's um, service oriented. We have this thing, let us lead by serving others. Um, so yeah, that's what I would well, say And I, I would suggest there's probably a lot of people who agree with me with this. If you just look to your right, you'll see a dynamic and diverse leader. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Tom, Tom is, is that not true, though, with, with local governments? You have to have that ability at times to be dynamic. You have to, you, yeah. without question, you have to have a significant sense of diversity. Yeah, I think so. And, and actually, if there's one thing that I would sort of lament in the, the, the sort of professional development for my, not for my career, but in, in my line of work, is that I, I think there is this sort of increasing push to make us more technical professionals than the job really necessarily warrants. She said the people skills. And I mean, I certainly won't want to sit here and say, oh, I have fantastic people skills, but it certainly is a very, very big part of what I do. And uh, when she said that, it reminded me of an exchange that I had at the last city manager's conference where we were sort of, we were talking about a younger person who was trying to get into the line of work and struggling with it a little bit. And I think it was a, a people skill issue. And uh, we were sort of having one of these just casual slap on the back type of conversations with a, with another manager and I said you know it is sort of a strange line of work because you have to be uh, you have to be pretty highly socially functioning but at the same time you have to have a very thick skin and occasionally kind of not care what people think and move mm -hmm. forward so it is, it is a sort of interesting uh, type of personality that, that that's needed the, the big piece uh, oftentimes when I'm talking with folks that, that are in key positions I'll just say it, it seems to be that a lot of it does deal with education and information, and part of that is trying to continue to educate the public, the larger mass of population that, that does have all those other job functions that may be, again, as Tom pointed out, focused with fire, or EMS, law enforcement, making sure the grass is cut, whatever it may be, but they're focused on doing their job, but they also need to understand how the totality of the system works. Is that something that, that you found as you've been doing this for the past few months, that understanding how it really works versus what the maybe the, some of the textbook models was has a little bit of difference to it? Yeah, I definitely think education is a very important aspect of it. There were some things that I didn't even know that firefighters did. Mm -hmm. um, so just like knowing the different aspects of local government and how they function, um, if there's a way to like educate the public on how certain things work, I think that would help um, even with recruiting more people um, because some people don't know that you can um, cut grass for the local government. Like some people see, we, we see people doing things, um, we know the trash gets taken out, we know that the grass gets cut, but some people don't know how they can even get into that line of work. So um, I think education is a very important part of that. Tom, this is a question that is related, but not necessarily directly related. It, when you look at employability in local governments now, how big an impact is, uh, quote, the benefit packages uh, affecting you in hiring people and bringing people in? You know, we talked about, you know, how much money am I going to make? But the other side is, I know, gosh, probably 10 years or more ago, I was hiring people and uh, and so forth. And one of the th things I would, people would ask, you know, what does the benefit package look like? Even people with high, very extremely high degrees, you know, I'll work if the benefits is good. What, what's happening? Because that's a field that is changing radically in, in what you're able to offer. We've seen some slow erosion of the sort of what you think of as a government benefit yeah. package over time. Uh, but of course, we've also seen an erosion of private sector benefit packages as well. Um, you know, my father, who's in his mid 70s, is sort of shocked that employers don't provide health care for the family yeah. of the employee anymore. Yeah. But I mean, that's almost an unheard of thing anymore. Absolutely. Um, so we've seen a little bit of erosion to it. Uh, but I, I do think that particularly in North Carolina, uh, North Carolina has one of the most vested, financially secure local government retirement systems in the entire country. Um, it is a funded system. Uh, you don't see us having issues like you see in some of the other states. So it is a very stable system. Now, demonstrating that value to one of your employees who's in his early 20s and would like a couple hundred more dollars a week or month and explain to them that, hey, well, you know, look, don't worry when you're when you hit 60, you know, you're going to be better taken care of. You know, that's, that's a little abstract sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, I would like to see the benefits improve, not really for my benefit, but just yeah. for, the, for the benefit in general. Um, but, but there is still definitely a solid benefit package. Uh, Silviana, and I'd, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on that because you kind of fit that <laughs> role model of the, of the young person coming in because, you know, historically, I can look back years past and I really was never concerned about that. But to Tom's point, he's exactly right on target. You know, you hit that 60 point, you <laughs> better believe you're thinking about it. And today's world is, is becoming more compressed 
and more realistic to say, how am I going to be impacted by that? So sometimes that can outweigh the salary, but I'd like to kind of get your feel on that. Um, a hundred percent honest, like I didn't even think about benefits. Like my parents mm -hmm. <laughs> had to tell me, like you know, make Tommy sure, were right on that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> make sure you're having good benefits because at twenty something, I'm not thinking about retirement mm -hmm. and that all that good stuff. I'm just thinking about like what I'm doing now yeah. and how much I'm getting paid. So um, it has been like educational to learn about what benefits are mm -hmm. and like how it will help me in the long run. Um, but yeah, like coming into it, I was just like, sign me up, like mm -hmm. I'll do it. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things, and I don't know how you change that because it, uh, I, I guess the, the structure of our brain has to change when we get older, we start recognizing <laughs> the critical part of that. Yeah. Um, we, we call it adulting now. Um, it's, it's been a transition because I thought that I was like an actual adult when I was in college, mm -hmm. but then you graduate and you're in the quote unquote real world and there are some things that they don't teach you in college mm -hmm. about, you know, 401ks and different things like that that you kind of have to learn on your own. Um, so yeah, I've been doing a lot of learning about that and um, like you said, the government does have some great benefits, so that's a plus. Is, is this program, when we look at the LEAD for North Carolina, its national compartment, is it truly something that can be a key factor, as pointed out in some of the literature, th that is critical to help economically distressed communities to survive? Is, is it that important that people need to look at this and think about either referring people or asking people to do like Silviana did, fill out an application and get involved? I don't know if I would say survival necessarily, but it's really, really, it's it's probably really, really close to that. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely important. These these types of programs, internships, um, it, it's important to get younger people into government. Period. So if they want to go and they want to work as a as a budget analyst for Durham County, that that's fantastic, and mm -hmm. it's getting them into the sector, and that that's a good thing. Period. Uh, but I but I would agree with you that that getting people into public service in some of these rural areas. Some of these areas that are being hit by, I mean, think about what our, our current national crises are, right? Mm -hmm. Opioids. Yeah. Where where is that where is that impact being felt? You know, so we, we have a lot of these issues that that really are some of the toughest issues we're facing are, are rural issues, uh, and we need good people here on the ground trying to address them. And it's interesting you mentioned that because ground zero for that is in Wilson, North Carolina, the home manufacturer of all the <laughs> opioids in in the world when it comes to. We you know that, there. yeah. <laughs> there you go. So I mean, you're really on top of it, and it's a highlighted thing. One, I'm gonna try to touch on this very quickly. That it, one of the things this program mentioned is this uh, MPA programs and kind of steering folks like you more to that master's program. You think this is going to help you uh, kind of think about well, I need to get in the you know master's of public administration program somewhere and and expand my academics. Yeah, course. and the training, we had three weeks of training at UNC Chapel Hill School of Government before we started work, so um, I learned a lot there that made me want to learn more, and building those those connections with the professors in the School of Government, um, and even the dean of the School of Government, um, I have no doubt in my mind that that's my next step afterwards. You got the key to the door right now. Tom, I'm going to give you a moment to talk about some key things happening in the city right quick. Go yeah. About 30, 45 seconds. Okay, uh, 30 or 45 seconds. Yeah. We have a really important process coming up and it's gonna be our Parks and Recreation Master Plan. And what could be more related to the quality of life in, in Clinton than, than, than Parks and Recreation and all everything that comes along with that? Uh, it's a big plan that you put in place for your entire recreation system. Uh, it is required and an integral part of getting grant money to actually build those improvements to the park system. And the first and probably most important component of that plan is going to be soliciting public feedback. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage everybody to keep their ear to the ground uh, in terms of monitoring our social media and our website and whatnot so that they know when the survey is going to come out, when we're going to have meetings where we ask them what they want. And I, then I would just remind everybody that we've got two fantastic events coming up. One is going to be our Halloween on the square and one is going to be our Christmas in the city. You can get those dates on our website as well. Absolutely, which sounds like to me we're going to have to have you back again. I want to thank both of you for being with us today. And as always, we're on television, so we're on a tight clock. <laughs> they will cut us off if I don't get this in. Again, thank you for being with us, ladies and gentlemen. Stay tuned each and every Tuesday. We
we look forward to seeing you again next week at 2.30 on Tuesdays, both on TV, radio, and printed in the newspaper. And as always, may God bless. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of We Should Know with host J.W. Simmons. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion regarding this or any episode, please send your emails to we should know edu at gmail.com. And remember to tune in every Tuesday at 2.30 for another informative episode of We Should Know.